Pueblo Mountain Village Dance by Vincent Scully, published by Times and Hudson in 1975. This book is written in love and admiration for the American Southwest and its people. It is primarily about Pueblo architecture and dances, but is intended neither as a complete history of Pueblo buildings nor as a proper anthropological exploration of the mythology and ceremonials of which the dances are only a part. Much fine work has been done along both these lines and the reader's attention is directed to it. Here is proposed only a general analysis of the form of the existing pueblos, though only incidentally as they looked in 1972 rather than, say, in 1900 or to Stubbs in 1950 and of some of their dances in themselves and as they are framed by the buildings and as both are related to landscape forms. I think that the contemporary pueblos can be best seen and valued in this way and can in fact hardly be understood or systematically appreciated otherwise. The dances themselves I believe to be the most profound works of art yet produced on the American continent. They call up a pity and terror which only Greek tragedy rivals, no less than a comic joy, at once animal and ironic, that suggests the precursors of Aristophanes. And to the beginnings of Greek drama, they are, I believe, fundamentally allied in a comparative sense. For these reasons, only enough reference is made to the grand, enduring and much admired architectural remains of Anasazi prehistory, primarily of the so-called Great or Classic Pueblo period of the 1100 to 1300 AD as seems necessary to approach the existing pueblos in their historical context and to set their position in a general art historical development. I also have something to say about Christian churches and Nabajo Hogans and, by way of epilogue, about the sacred tipi of the Mescalero Apache. So approached, I hope that this topic as a whole can open up several wider avenues of thought and architecture about, that is, all our natural and man-made environments and the meaning of human action in them. Only in the Pueblos, in that sense, could my Greek studies be completed, because their ancient rituals are still performed in them. The chorus of Dionysus still dances there. As an art historian, I feel that I must apologize for any trespass upon ethnographic ground, which is as little as I could make it, and for the occasional intrusion of the first person, which I have here too managed to avoid in my writing. It was the dances that drove me in that direction. I came to feel somehow that it was the only proper way to describe them. We see everything from our own psychic stance, as Taylor pointed out some time ago, and it is at once inhuman and unscientific to pretend otherwise. Every ceremony Every dance, for example, also changes in some way each time it is performed, so that abstract generalizations can be historically misleading, despite their structuralist popularity at the present time. For this reason, I have tried to write only about things I have experienced at first hand, and have relegated much other material to bibliographical references. Yet, as the drums recede, a question relative to consciousness and the work of art may well be raised. 
Can the ceremonies of what, for lack of a more accurate term, Western European anthropology describes as a primitive people be regarded as works of art and described as such? Surely they can and must be, and they are indeed almost the ultimate works, since they directly form human behavior and distill, in the architecture of their natural and man-made spaces, a sculptural and pictorial essence of human action and of the structure of human thought. They, like all works of art, always flesh out at least two realities and live in two kinds of time, first in that of their people and secondly outside and beyond it, capable of any number of unexpected effects upon others, able to endow themselves with a thousand meanings and inhabiting the time of their watcher and perhaps eternity alone.